Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, how many capers have you been up to lately? None, but I hope to be up to one soon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We're not going to talk about that. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to know too much about your capers. Luckily, we do have somebody who is very familiar with capers on the show, and here to talk a little bit about capers noir coming to Kickstarter soon uh, is uh, Craig Campbell. Uh, Craig, welcome back to the show. Hi. Hey. Thanks for having me back. Uh, it's good to talk to you guys again. It's good to have you back. Yeah, always fun to have you on. Last year, in the way, way back, the long, long ago, <laughs> um, you talked to us a little bit about a, a game called Capers, and um, you're um, going to Kickstarter with something called Capers Noir. And that really interested me because noir as a setting is just really intriguing, whether you're like Spider-Man or anything else. Or Batman. Sure. Batman in the, oh, that was more of a uh, steampunk version. I want to know a little bit about uh, the noir in this as a setting. So comparative to like capers, you know, the, the basic capers, what does capers noir bring to the party? Um, well, to uh, to just give a little bit of a basic basis um, for people who don't know, um, capers is um, a super powered game. You know, it's a super powered characters in uh, you're playing gangsters or law enforcement in the roaring 20s. So mm -hmm. it's like the old old school gangster kind of movies, those types of things. Um, but you've got some superpowers and uh, Capers Noir it basically does two things. It's a supplement for the Capers game. So there's stuff in there that is perfectly usable. You can just pull it out, drop it right into the base Capers game for those people who just want more stuff. Mm -hmm. More options, more powers, you know, GM, there's additional GM stuff, all that, that sort of thing. Um, but I thought rather than just doing a generic supplement of like, well, here's just a bunch of more crunch, um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll expand the world a little bit and I'll take the 1920s forward into the 1940s and uh, prohibition is over. And we are in uh, in the 1940s, so it's World War II and the immediate aftermath of it. In Capers Noir, the uh, the shift of the story goes from the prohibition kind of gangster shoot 'em up kind of uh, action to something a little more moody, um, a little darker, a little more mysterious um, with noir, uh, noir stories. Uh, for those people um, out there who maybe aren't familiar with noir as a genre, um, it's often associated with um, like movies, uh, there's certain a certain type of movie from like the 40s, 50s, and kind of into the 60s a little bit um, that are typically black and white. They're usually crime dramas, often involving criminals, cops, sometimes private detectives. Uh, the hard-boiled detective and the femme fatale, um, there's usually some, you know, there's a murder or a kidnapping or something that's going on, some uh, some crime. There's usually a whole series of twists and turns. It's The story never turns out to be what you expected it from the beginning. There's double crosses and triple crosses. And if you're lucky, hmm. things, you, you kind of end up back where you were by the end of the, of the story. You, there's usually not much of a happy ending. Um, there might be like a, a right. little bit of a silver lining, but it's oftentimes, um, you know, things go poorly because it's a very cynical uh, genre. And so right. it's all it's all mood. So that's kind of what Capers Noir is attempting to do with the setting portion of it. So you can play the game in this alternate setting, tell a different type of a story with these criminals and cops that have superpowers. I see. So so uh, so none of my characters really are going to have a happy ending is what you're giving. <laughs> well, it, 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 it's entirely up to the GM, of course. I mean, if you want to have um, happy, you know, have uh, good conclusions. I mean, here's the thing, like. In a, in a noir story, you could have a murder. Yeah. Um, and whether you're cops or criminals investigating somebody's death and you're looking into it and you're going through and there's an investigation and there's a, you know, there's, there's twists and turns. And eventually, you know, maybe you find the person who committed the murder and they, they can, um, you know, they can pay for it. You know, if you're, if you're playing criminals, you might decide to execute them yourselves or find a way to, to set them up and get them caught by the cops. If you're cops, you know, you're looking to, to arrest them. But what happens if that, uh, you know, if the, if the murderer is someone you care about? Right. 
Um, okay. So and that becomes the shades of gray. Like, what do you do? Do you let him get away? Well, if you let him get away, then this murder goes unsolved. That person never really gets avenged. There's no justice. But if you turn him in, you've done the right thing. But you've just turned in, um, you know, a, a friend or a family member that you care about. So there's always right. like this little bit of a darkness to it. Now, being a noir setting, is this more focused on the narrative then? A number of, of film critics, and I'm mostly speaking, you know, from my experience with film noir, um, although, you know, noir does make it into, you've got hard-boiled detective novels and things like that. And there's comics that have done some noir things. Um, but, you know, there's a number of film critics who have, you know, referred to like film noir is very much that there's a narrative there, but the narrative is second in importance to the style. It's usually a very visually um, arresting kind of story. Um, not not all noir stories are, but there's, you know, the classic ones are. And then some of the modern ones are, too. Was the movie Sin City? Sin City is absolutely mm-hmm. a noir story. I mean, because okay, I remember it was, it was very comic book comic, style for yeah. a movie. And I remember it being black and white with a splash of color. Yeah. And the splash of color is just there to draw attention to certain details, but it's otherwise black and white and, and that styling in the, in the, the graphic novels. And then of course, translated pretty much directly into the movie is very, very noir. I mean, that's like almost like a modern day retelling of that exact style of cinema. Mm, um, right. Whereas the, it's, it's very ahead. focused on the story and the narration of the story, noir settings. Uh, typically usually a lot of, of slow drama punctuated by, um, furious action and then some plot twists sure reveals later on dolores it was you the whole time yeah who turns out you know well, without giving anything away about sin, sin sin city it's like you know there's there's a number of double crosses or reveals of somebody being behind some nefarious deed that you had met earlier in the story and you didn't know um, and then they suddenly kind of snake that that character back around and they're behind it right yeah, we, we wouldn't want to ruin Sin City for anyone, although it did come out like <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> and, and, and your audience probably has seen it and read all the graphic novels. Yeah, that's fine. I would hope so, um, because it was, it was pretty good. I did not see the sequel. I, have not I, seen I haven't it. seen the sequel either. No, I didn't. I heard um, it's, I heard it's eh, eh. I heard, you know, it's so-so. The, first, yeah. the, the initial one, the first one was, was really solid, though. I just like the idea, like, thematically... Noir as as a genre seems to be a it, it allows you to tell some really interesting kinds of stories in a role playing setting um, where you get to like have like those those darker kind of grimier settings and like that kind of murder mystery sort of air to it. Um, was that the intention when you decided to like transport yourself to the 40s and, and use that as a style for Capers Noir? Uh, certainly. It was uh, just one of those things that I, I've, I've been thinking about capers and what I might do with supplements and other things. And I'm, I'm trying this first one and hopefully it will do well enough to make it, you know, worth trying to do another one. Mm-hmm. Um, but I figured, OK, yeah, I want to give it, you know, give give the uh, the setting that I'm giving and the progression through history into a different era. Um, stylistic change. It's not going to just be, OK, well, now it's gangsters and cops, but they're in the 40s and it's just a different year. So there's like, well, there's some new inventions and the cars are different. And, right. Um, I want to, you know, give it a different a different feel. And this, you know, I, I kind of intended capers to be very action, shoot them up, you know, um, although it could get certainly, get, you know, can get political and, you know, whatever way you can think of to rise to the top of a criminal empire. Capers Noir is kind of uh, intended. It, it, there's there's the potential for um, just kind of built into that, like sl- more personal stories, because, again, there's going to be double crosses, betrayals. You can end up with characters that by the time they get done with their story, you know, a, a number of game sessions, they're, they're kind of like, oh, my God, when is when is it going to finally get good? When is when, is, when are things going to go well for me? <laughs> that, that that in some ways is like uh, every uh, version of a, of a role playing game. It can and be sometimes yeah. again. It's a long hard slog to the finish line. When it comes to the mechanics, did you have any mechanics that helped to uh, flesh that out for the for the setting? Uh, well, the, the mechanics are uh, didn't change as far as the core mechanics go. You you need the the core game to play with Capers Noir. Capers Noir is just a thin supplement, fifty or so pages. Right. Um, so the core mechanics are necessary. So that hasn't changed. The card flipping thing with the press your luck and all that. But I did um, in, uh, include a couple of um, subsystems of mechanics as well as some optional stuff. 
um, some character gen uh, character generation options so you can generate your character a little differently. Um, and the, 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 the two big ones are, since it is noir stories and there's often mysteries involved, I, I uh, actually had a, um, a co-conspirator, Chris Sneezak, who helped write um, investigation rules um, mm. using the, uh, the caper system with the card flipping and everything. So you have a, a subset of rules that allows you to play out investigations where, you know, failing an investigative check doesn't just grind the story to a halt. Because nothing is worse than just like if you just use straight checks and it's like, well, I failed, so nothing happens. You're always moving the investigation forward. But, you know, if you're succeeding on the check or succeeding with the boon, you know, getting an ace or something like that, then you're succeeding better and you're getting more information and more, you know, more clues and so forth. And you, you work your way through the investigation like that. And then there can be downsides to it. Like when you fail checks, complications arise and um, things can spiral out of control. So, so it's kind of like, do I find anything at the scene of the crime? It's like, well, make a check. I failed. You find nothing. No, that's not how it is. If you fail... You... <laughs> Versus, oh, well, you screwed that piece of evidence in, up. In, 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 the, in the game, uh, the way it works, because like I said, nothing, nothing kills an investigation faster than a fail, uh, you know, a failed check that gets you nothing. You fail a check, you still get a clue. But all you get is just the barest clue. If you make the check, you get a clue and you get to ask a question. Um, if you make the check with a boon, you can ask more questions or the GM provides uh, more detail. Um, so you can, uh, you can learn more by, by making your checks. Oh, okay. So if I fail, I, I know that I have a piece of paper. And if, uh, if I succeed, then I might know like where the paper came from. And if I succeed with a boon, I might know who wrote it. Well, the piece of paper isn't going to lead you anywhere. So the, the, Failing and getting a piece of paper, there still has to be something that leads you somewhere. Okay. Um, but it, let's see, like, you know, you get um, you get a piece of paper that's uh, you know, got a message scrawled on it, and it's signed with initials. So now you've okay. got initials to work from, so you at least have that. Mm -hmm. So you can start searching around and, and talking to contacts and, and whatnot and trying to figure out who might write a note like this with those initials. That becomes where you go. But if you, um, if you succeed... Or, or succeed with a boon or something like that, um, then you know, somebody in the group identifies like who that who's, who, who, whose initials those are, you know, okay. or, or maybe at least narrows it down. It could be this person or this person. So now you've got a much narrower, you know, you're, you're, you're better, you're, you're set better to move on in the investigation. You've got more to work with. So it's a little okay. harder. It's harder to push it forward if you fail, but it's not impossible. I see. Okay. Now, if I'm really bad at rolling, because I am, and I, I keep getting, like, uh, fails, like, continuously. Uh, will the clues eventually lead me in the wrong direction, or could they, like, throw me off of where I'm supposed to be going? Um, they could, rather than lead you in the wrong direction, they'll lead you to, uh, you know, along the, along the, you know, in the direction of solving the mystery. But, mm -hmm. yeah, let's say, uh, let's say you're tracking a murderer. Okay. Um, you're trying to you're trying to get to get a murderer. Somebody killed your buddy, right? And you yes. go along and you're and you're making investigative checks and you're moving along and and you you fail a few times. Well, uh, one of the things that you can use in the game is there's a uh, um, a countdown tracker. So every so many failed checks, something happens. So oh. for example, you fail two checks, the killer strikes again before you get to them. Oh, okay. Um, the killer strikes, you know, four, four failed checks. The killer strikes again, and it's the mayor's son. Oh. You know, ramping in. Yeah. And if you're playing cops, well, now all of a sudden, there's a great deal of pressure on you. Mm, I see. Okay. Yeah, so basically time is of the essence, and uh, the, more, the more fails that I get where it's like, oh, I goofed again. There's actual real world consequences. The the world is not stopping for me while I figure this out. Right. I and see. if you get too many fails, maybe you ultimately do figure out who the murderer was, but they get away. Ah. So you get you get a little bit of a win, but they get away. It's heavy rain. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he just walks away. I did everything wrong. Now, what what happens if your character ends up getting killed by the murderer? Uh, well, just that, just as in Capers, um, the the GM has no control over whether or not your character dies. Oh, cool! Um, in That's the game, if you drop to yeah, if you drop to zero hits, you make a choice. Your okay. character is either going to get knocked out, 
you know, temp, you know, briefly kidnapped some some way or another, pulled out of the story as effectively punishment for getting your character knocked down um, for a for a short time, and then you come back with some penalties until you play for a little longer, or you can decide, no, my character is going to die, and then you get one more round. Oh, okay. To either go out in a in a blaze of glory or an utter failure. Oh, interesting. Okay. So there is really a give and take to to saying like, you know, I yeah, okay, my character's going to die, but I am going to get something out of it. Like it's it's not just a well, I, I roll over and either I'm going to get up or I'm not. Can I go out in a blaze of utter failure? Sure, why not? <laughs> Shine on, you crazy diamond. <laughs> Was that your intention, or...? Yeah, in Blaze of Utter Glory, it's like, oh, I found the murderer and it was me all along. <laughs> well, okay, wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and then you bite down on the cyanide pill. What, you so... <laughs> and, no one, and no one can ever find out no. if you were telling the no, truth no, no, or not. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on a second. This is why... It, oh, man. So now you play... <laughs> now your character is... The murderer the whole time sure what or they or they just said they were maybe they're just trying to i don't know maybe they suddenly feel like the actual killer oh. needs to be vindicated oh. and like <laughs> you get sympathetic to the yeah you get sympathetic to your to the person you've been tracking down you're like it was Who me are you playing okay this is no <laughs> i'm being i'm being very idealistic here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, what did the killer do? Really? Think about it for a second. But oh, they, uh, I've, I've been on the show enough times to know that Alex goes off the rails once an episode at least. Once. Yeah. once. I go three. The, go the killer three. saved my daughter from some life-threatening thing, and I'm paying him back by letting him go. He's <laughs> kind of like a vigilante? He's, you, you see no, him he, more... he just wanted the police officer on his, on his payroll for something. <laughs> So what? Okay, come on, get with it, Nathan. Okay, okay, but now I need to take this back to the actual game. If my character proclaims that they are the murderer, what happens? Um, I don't know how to tell that story because <laughs> <Okay. it, laughs> that, that's all on you in uh, your game itself, um, not like the, the, the GM and the players. If if you if you want to have a, a narrative element that can do that, where you want to you know l- allow. Uh, a player, maybe a player's just gotten tired of playing that character and they want to do something yeah. else. This is a cool way for them to to write their character out of the story. Yeah. Um, maybe they're not the killer because the GM kind of does know who that is, but maybe they're an accomplice. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, that, they yeah. Can, that they can work something out and say, hey, this is going to be a fun way to have, have there be a betrayal within the group and have that, you know, play a role down the road. Because yeah. uh, if, if this character betrays the other people um, that they're supposed to be working with, then that might color those characters' attitudes and actions later. Yeah. I mean, that would be very noir. It would be. It would be uh, it would be interesting, actually, if they if, if you had a uh, a version of the rules where the the GM actually doesn't know who the killer is, but one of the players is totally the killer. And if you had buy in from the players that that's yeah kind of that that type of thing can happen, sure. Yeah, because uh, I mean, for the GM, that's got to be amazing. Like, I don't even know who the killer is. Now. <laughs> what am as I? Long going as, to? as long as all the players are okay with the idea of losing a character. Oh God, what were those card games like? Resistance or Syndicate or one of those? Like, is that is that like um, Secret Hitler? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, that's that's another one that's just kind of like yeah, yeah. We're making an RPG variant, Secret Hitler Noir that's game. We'll call, it, we'll, call it, we'll call it Secret Hitman. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, I guess I guess it is kind of, and actually that makes sense because uh, if if it's the 1940s, a lot of people would be thinking about Hitler right about then. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, and the, and the game doesn't. It's not like you're not playing war. Well, you can play. You can be. You can be playing you know, in the midst of the war. The war. The war. The World War II colors the story. Um, right. Colors the setting, but it's not you know you're not necessarily playing soldiers. So you could play a soldier com- that's you know just come back or whatever. Right. But one of the things that World War II does do for noir is a little bit of a twist beyond the uh, the spe- you know, specifically the noir thing is that World War II, um, due to the amount of death and devastation that's taken place, has torn some openings and thin some spots in the veil between this world and the world of the dead things. Noir has a touch of horror, horror type of stuff to it as well, which is to right. say 
ghosts and revenants and things that go bump in the night. And I like to describe it as like, you know, you could be investigating a, mur a murder and the first uh, person you question is the ghost of the deceased. That's cool. So basically, I'm the kid from Sixth Sense. <laughs> <laughs> just talking. except well, everybody everybody's the kid from six cents everybody can see dead people oh everybody is okay yeah. well that's that's that that seems more fair so like ghosts and spirits and all of that that plays into this as well which makes sense because it's noir but it's still going to be like the supernatural elements that you had in in the base capers game sure it's just uh in this case it's there's effectively monsters um uh, you know, and they, they have a few things that are kind of special about them, but they are otherwise treated more or less like super powered characters. They have, you know, they have powers like, you know, there's certain monsters that just they do things that are appropriate to powers. You know, there's a type of ghost that cr create illusions. There's one that can uh, uh, possess. There's a, you know, I've added up there's a possession power in the game so you can possess other people. And this ghost can do that. Life drain, which is an, you know another type of damage. Here, here's a scenario. What if you have a ghost who's a murderer or commits crimes, but they do it through possession? So you can't actually pin down who the criminal is because they possess different bodies to commit each crime, <laughs> but they're all connected. Um, it, unless I'm mistaken, that is a movie called Fallen. Is well, that right? Am I rem remembering that right? I don't no. think I've seen that movie. So, Denzel but Washington, I... he's tracking, um, like, there's a demonic spirit thing that's jumping from person to person. Am I am I remembering that correctly? Well, if you're not, we just created it and you just <laughs> cast it. Yeah. <laughs> so congratulations, Denzel needed the work anyway. <laughs> what I'm trying to figure out though is, could I have a spirit possess the GM? Nathan, what? No. Yes. <laughs> GM's not a character. It is in my in in my experience. The GM's no. always a character. Many of them, simultaneously. Mm. Think about it. It's true. In the uh, <laughs> segue, which they didn't have back in the nineteen uh, forties. Hey, that makes me realize something about the nineteen forties. I wanted to talk about. See how I used segue to make a segue, Alex. <laughs> So back in the so so as you were saying, like uh, World War II is not usually like the the setting itself, like it's not necessarily the backdrop. But usually, when I think of noir, I think of you know you're like in the city at night. That's right. my traditional thing. So is that what you're assuming people are going to be using as a backdrop when they're playing? Well, the the setting book is you know the setting portion of the book is going to provide a, a backdrop of Los Angeles. Oh, okay. During the 40s. Um, okay. So you can certainly, I mean, you can you can set it wherever you want. You can take it to small town. I mean, there's plenty of noir stories that are um, set in like suburbia or small towns. Um, I mean, you know, half of the, you know, maybe more than half, a lot of the Coen Brothers movies are, are effectively noir stories. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things to kind of draw from. I mean, uh, just like off the top of my head, I'm thinking like and the Big Lebowski is one of my favorites, and that is certainly a noir story. It's a it's a kidnapping that turns out to not be a kidnapping, but then turns out to be a kidnapping, and it's a classic bit of noir too. Is like somebody kind of gets pulled into the problem, like they're they're normally from outside of it. Like there's a private detective, or in the case of the Big Lebowski, the dude who's right. just living their life, doing their thing, and they're suddenly embroiled in all of this crime and mystery. And, that's, okay, so that's interesting because usually when I think about Big Lebowski, maybe just because it's not in black and white and I'm always thinking of noir in that term, I, I don't necessarily think of it as a noir. But if we were to think about it in that kind of term, I'm wondering like what other movies I might not have considered noir. Like would, would The Nice Guys be considered noir? Uh, the Nice Guys, which one's that? That would be... I'm uh, not sure. I don't think I've seen this. Uh, Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe, and it was it was all about kind of like this hard bitten cop, and uh, he's got this like uh, younger sidekick who has a daughter, and he kind of gets embroiled in this whole murder mystery thing, uh, and they're trying to figure out who murdered this girl. And that, that feels an awful lot like a noir story. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's what I'm thinking, even though it doesn't really look that way. And it feels a lot lighter in tone, like it's actually probably more a comedy than a, than than a drama. But um, 
but I, I kept thinking to myself, yeah, it's like a buddy cop sort of, you know, finding finding the bad guy story. Well, if, and it that's leans, per- if it leans a little more comedy, then, you know, it, it, you can cert- you can always have, you know, stories that are that uh, are have uh, noir stylings, noir touches that might otherwise be a comedy or something mm. else. Um, but like Memento. OK, that's totally a noir story. All oh, right. That's one, it's one giant mystery. He's con- you know the main mm-hmm. character is constantly learning new information, um, right? And having and having a hard time remembering it. Um, yes. <laughs> the usual <laughs> sus. I would say the usual suspects is probably a noir story. It's oh, actually, okay. It twists the idea because that's all a big mystery too, and it's it's all about criminal you know crime gone wrong, and it's like it it, it all ends badly. Um, yeah. And uh, you know the 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 you know many of those noir stories they they love to have the. Uh, the voiceover narration by the private detective talking about, you know, like she walked into my door and yeah. just as I was about to close, you know, and the usual suspect sort of has that. It's just that because it's all a flashback, it's yeah. ver- verbal can't being interrogated. He's mm-hmm. telling the story and that's the narration. Right. Right. Um, so it's just a different uh, you know, stylistic choice of how to do the narration. Yeah. Fargo is absolutely a noir story. Oh yeah. Fargo's good. Parker's good for that. Um, happy time murders, but then they actually made Again, that to be a little, a little comedy. But <laughs> that's more of that's more of a comedy making fun of noir <laughs> more than anything. Um, Probably the best example of of a more contemporary one is L.A. Confidential. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. That makes you know, that's, sense. that's that's twists and turns and who's corrupt and who's not, and it's you know you, you can't trust any of the cops in that movie. Right, and then there's Die Hard. I'm gonna say Die Hard. To die. That's that's an action movie, my friend. <laughs> no, it's no, no, no. It's mm. totally a noir. No, you have the hard. No, no, no. You know who the villain is right at the beginning. You know who the hero is right at the beginning. It's a happy ending. That's not a noir story. Sorry. Actually, I'm looking at a. I'm looking at a list of uh, like modern noir films too. I was just just for inspiration, and uh, the Nice yeah. Guys actually is on here. So yeah. Oh, okay. Perfect. Um, you know, maybe hoping. maybe it's got a little more funny to it than than the typical noir, but it mm. it still has those stylings of, uh, you know, in this case, it's like I guess two mismatched detectives, and they kind of yeah. get drawn into a messed up situation. Oh it's, oh, it's a good movie. It's worth watching. Um, I liked it, but I will say that Die Hard is still a uh, a Christmas movie because then I can watch it every Christmas. Sure, and so Anyways. is Gremlins. Yeah, so is so is Christmas. and Home Alone. You have to watch it at Christmas. It doesn't count otherwise. Have you taken a good look at Home Alone? I saw a thing online. I just I love mentioning this because it's it's like I never noticed it until somebody on the internet pointed it out. If you if you look at Home Alone and you remove all of the uh, visually in your head, remove all the Christmas decorations. Don't think about the tree. Don't think about the garland. Don't think about the stockings. None of that. Right. right? Just look at the decor, the interior decoration of the house. What yeah. the house looks like. It's all red and green, like everywhere. It's red. Oh, and green. neat! That whole house, though, that the McAllister family must be wealthy enough to be able to redecorate their home by the season, every three <laughs> months, because that whole house is Christmas themed. Like bear, uh, like plant and berry wallpaper. There's um, red tile and 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 red pots and pans hanging from the ceiling. Uh, there's you know green carpet, green paint, and red paint on different walls. I mean, it's it's nuts. Wow. Yeah, see, I thought you were going to say something like, you know, Harry and Marv would have been dead about five minutes into that movie. <laughs> well, I've had that discussion, too. There's like, who takes the who takes the crowbar to the chest? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, that's oh, yeah. Harry. That's Harry. Harry. Yeah, yeah that, he, that should have that should have caused cardiac arrest and killed him. Yeah, he shouldn't have made it through that. No, <laughs> no, that, that, that should not have worked. <laughs> you need to have a um, someone run a game of capers where they are trying to figure out who booby trapped and killed these guys. <laughs> It leads him to the kid. We need to find Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin! Wow. This house looks like it was broken into, but these guys are dead. Wow, there's a lot of blunt force trauma in what go. the heck happened here. You know that the old guy next door would be their first su- suspect, though. Oh, sure, yeah, the creepy guy. <laughs> the creepy guy with the shovel. That'd be, that'd be the big misdirect, you know? Oh, yeah, that's the, totally the misdirect. And then the next thing is like, hey, that lady with the birds. And then it's the pizza dude. And it, then... <laughs> ultimately, it turns out to be Buzz. Oh God! Buzz plays the plays the dupe, but he's actually really smart. It's all a facade. I still think it was Biff Tannen. 
But we're gonna no, we're, we're gonna make this a thing. We're gonna have a Home Alone Noir. <laughs> Home Alone Noir. You know, I'm I'm <laughs> cool with that. That's a good that's a good game. That's a good game worth playing. Getting back to your Die Hard comment real quick. Um, oh yeah. Uh, with Murders and Acquisitions, with my first game, which is all about corporate uh, uh, theft and intrigue and murder and fighting your way up the corporate ladder at, at, a, con- at a convention years ago. I ran a special event that was um, basically using the, the murders and acquisition system. Players uh, portrayed um, characters in Die Hard, but they were they were like you know mis- uh, they were they were the boss, Mister was it Nakamura, whatever the boss was. Nakamura, name was. yeah, thing. Um, and well, Ellis and well, Holly Gennaro, mm-hmm. and uh, then somebody was playing like I made up a character, you know, the janitor. I don't remember what his name was. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the story opens with. Um, with Hans Gruber and all the terrorists coming in and taking them all captive at the at the holiday party, and then um, John McClane busts in with a gun to take them all out, and they mow him down. Mm-hmm. He's dead mm-hmm. in the first act, and now the other characters have to save them save themselves. Oh my, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, it was, was fun. I was starting to think to myself, that is the weirdest version of Clue I've ever heard of. <laughs> it's like we're we're we're. Who killed John McClane? It's one of these characters. All, all, all seven of those guys over there. They just yeah. blew him away with machine guns. Yeah. Clue is a noir. And the movie, I'm going to make that case. Uh, I mean, it's a comedy, certainly, but I think, it's, yeah, it's got noir trappings. It's, it's, a, it's, it's not really built. It's not real built around criminals, but it's built around a crime. There's a there's a there's a murder. Um, yep. It's a lot of misdirection. You know, you're led to believe that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think darn near every one of the characters is is suspected as being the murderer at some point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, everyone's got a motive. Everyone's a suspect. Everyone wasn't somewhere. No one's got an alibi. And it, 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 it holds up stronger. You know, I think it falls better into the category of murder mystery. Um, right. In a more, in more straightforward sense, because noir is kind of a stylized murder mystery. And, it's, and, and noir isn't always a murder. You know, there can be other... Right. Like if we go back to like a Sin City, like a lot of those are not necessarily a murder that people are trying to solve. But it's, you no, know, there's, there's gang wars and gang wars and murder and yeah. corruption. And there's thieving and you know, there's all sorts of stuff. People are being kidnapped and taken yep. hostage and stuff. Yeah. And so and apparently Elijah Wood is some kind of Wolverine character. I could never figure <laughs> that out. But in in Capers Noir, it says that you have a, a bunch of new NPCs to use in the setting. So what I'm trying to. What I'm wondering is, what does a good uh, noir-based NPC have to have? I mean, you can you can do all the classics. Um, I've got like in the in the in the book there will be um, uh, some of the the classic tropes, like you know for the for ge- like generic NPCs. I've got a femme fatale and a private investigator, um, yeah. a corrupt politician, you know those types of things. And then okay. in the Los Angeles setting, uh, it's mostly criminals and, and law enforcement type characters, although there's a few kind of peripheral characters um, that are in there. You know, like one of the things I did was, uh, you know, twisted the history a little bit. And in the 40s, Bugsy Siegel was big in Los Angeles. He's the Los Angeles re- representative of the East Coast syndicate. So like people like Meyer Lansky and, and Lucky Luciano have that, you know, the, the crime families out in out east. Um, and they're branching out into West and they're putting their fingers in different places. And Bugsy's kind of running their operation in um, Los Angeles. But then he gets killed. Um, oh. and I moved I moved his murder up a little bit uh, oh. for Capers Noir. And he's dead and okay. he's a ghost and he's out for revenge. Is Bugsy a character in the game? Can I play him? No, can he's he, an can NPC. I... He's a ghost. He's a ghost NPC. OK. <laughs> OK. I want to be I want to be Bugsy Seagull now. <laughs> I, uh, that's unfortunate and actually i i should mention that the the i i provided guidance but the uh los angeles uh backdrop um is actually written by elizabeth and i'm not going to try to pronounce her last name and she's going to be so mad at me um it starts with a ch it's got about 15 letters in it okay it's, uh, <laughs> um, if, if, yeah, if you know okay. if you know angry hamster publishing um she she makes she, you know she she does games too she's there's probably oh. people right now screaming at the at the at their uh Shape computers. Project cool? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Uh, I, I I believe we had we them had on Elizabeth. the show. Yeah, okay, yeah. Elizabeth. Her. Oh, that's why it, she's written for yes. damn near everything. She's freelance. She freelances like crazy. She's very prolific and very good. Yeah. Um so she wrote all, you know, so yeah. there's a few things in there that were kind of my idea, like Bugsy Siegel being a ghost, but then she included the Black Dahlia murderer as an oh, NPC. Okay. 
You know, okay. this is this is the period when the Black Dahlia murderer is running around killing. You could, and you don't have to have it as a Black Dahlia murderer. You could have it like as the Red Iris murderer if you wanted. You could just use any color and flower. It's fine. <laughs> you could just put them together, make yeah, it work. Just, well, you might as well you know, set it in Miami and just you know, yeah, shake, shake it all up. Just Dexter the thing up. The Green Zinnia murders. Say I'm a GM because I I am. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no question resolved. No one wants that. Trust me. So say say I'm looking to run like a a, a crime noir game. What would be the advice that you would give to me on how to structure that? Well, there are certainly many ways to do it, um, okay. but I would say just like as a as a suggestion, you know, either set up the the mystery, you know, introduce the the murder or the the you know the bombing or the arson or the kidnapping or whatever right away mm -hmm. but but give it a little bit of time to breathe so like in the after in that first kickoff give everybody a chance to kind of establish character and kind of figure out how they're gonna go about doing things and then you know run them through an investigation keep it mostly slow paced speak quite a bit to the style of what you're seeing in the visuals and the auditory you know get get a little deeper than you might normally with describing mm. just how dark the night is or just how musty it smells mm. or, you know, you're at the CD hotel and everything smells like sweat. Draw upon those sorts of things and let it let it run a little slow, let it breathe a little. And then every so often punctuate it with a major reveal or a bit of action that will help to kind of shock people. You know, it'll, it'll just get them all to sit up. You know, you like you'll have your player sitting on the table and they'll all be kind of real quiet and they're just kind of paying attention and following the story and they're solving a mystery and it's real toned down and then bam, you know, something really takes off and, and twists something in the other direction and make sure to have the, the ultimate resolution shouldn't be linear. Not to say that you can't have an adventure where they go from, you know, clue to clue to clue to clue, but there should ideally be at least one twist in there where like they're led very strongly to believe that it's this person or that this is what happened. And then at some point it takes a hard left turn and it's something completely different okay. at least one time. If I'm good at writing a murder mystery, I'm going to be great at GMing a crime noir. Well, one of the great things, and I, I, I talk about this with GMing in general, is that if you just sit back and let the players talk, they'll write half your story for you. And you can do this with a noir story, with a mystery, with the twisting turn. As long as you, you've got like, okay, I've planned for this. This is what I think this character did. You know, double cross this character and this character did this and they're going to think that this character is a good guy but they're actually a bad guy and this is what I'm planning. And as long as um, you know you you don't disrupt the uh, the world that you've created because if you if you've established that you know there's somebody that's really really bad and corrupt and everything and having them suddenly be a good guy is you know without reason is a little weird. Um, but hmm. if the, you know the players can be because they're going to be solving a mystery right so they're going to be talking to each other offering suggestions about like where to go next, who they think did it, who they think is behind this or who they think um, set somebody else up or whatever. And if they come up with something that is uh, better <laughs> or more interesting than what you planned, yeah. there's nothing wrong with just saying, oh, yeah, that's exactly how it happened. <laughs> um, don't do it all the time, obviously. Otherwise, they'll just manipulate you and just <laughs> they'll just solve it by, by yeah. narrating the, the story for themselves. But every yeah. so often, there's nothing wrong with that because it, uh, it makes the story more interesting. It, it, one of the players invented something that you ha hadn't thought of. So it's surprising and fun for you. And as long as it fits, this, you know, you can work, make it work in the story and it gives them a win. You know, there's yeah. there's as a player, it's always a great feel. Like, I'll bet you there's a vampire. You know, there's like and then like, <laughs> oh, yeah, they're absolutely. I've done that in my game. That's my favorite example. It's like, I'll bet you there's a vampire in town. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's absolutely what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I and I, I like I changed my villain because <laughs> that was a much better idea. And uh, yeah, Perfect. so there's there's nothing wrong with that. Don't Perfect. do it too much, though. Too late. No. <laughs> crap <laughs> i would go back when my players would do th something and say hold it a second i think that they might have inadvertently gotten themselves into a really interesting story element that otherwise they would not have fallen into and so guess what it's a story element now yep sorry <laughs> it is now it's a great way to steer them back steer the story back on track if they're if they're if they're moving down what you had if, if they go after something else that's that's not what you had kind of part of the story, that becomes, quote unquote, a red herring. Mm. Um, and so in, in one of the worst things that can happen is in, in, a, in a game like this is for the players to follow the red herring too long. 
Okay. If they follow the red herring and they figure out it's red herring pretty quickly, okay, that's cool. That's like a little twist. But if they fo- if they spend you know forty five minutes following the red herring and you just let them roll and roll and roll and roll and nothing's going to happen, that sucks. So yeah, the, let the red herring not be a red herring. As they're talking about it, figure out a way for the red herring to not be red herring. Right, because at that point, uh, if it is, no one's going to enjoy that. <laughs> And sometimes you will create a red herring by accident. You know, like you just be, you know, you know this from GMing that players will latch on to the thing that you never expected them to latch on to. Mm-hmm. Um, so you yeah. can be playing and you've got like, OK, I've got this cast of, you know, eight NPCs that are all part of this big mystery. And then they're going to want to talk to the butler and you give the butler a name and a funny accent. And suddenly they want to <laughs> know everything there is to know about the butler. Right. And, and did the butler do it? And all that, you know, and so now, you, well, now crap, now I got to work the butler into the story. So just go ahead and do that. Like, let that, if they if they get fixated on the butler, maybe the butler's involved somehow. That, isn't that the trope, though? Once you give, give an NPC a name, suddenly they are part of the story? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> well, the, the real killer is having, if you have an NPC that you've alluded to that does have a name, you know, the, the players know the name and they know something about the character. And that character is, let's say, ultimately the bad guy that they're after. But they haven't met the character, so they haven't interacted with them. So you haven't used a voice or affected any sort of cliche or, or just like, you know, colloquial terminology that he might like, you know, like, does, does he does he suck his teeth or does 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 she walk with a cane or, you know, be like these little details that you give to a character to help to bring them to life that if the character has only been mentioned, the, the players don't know about that. But then you introduce them to the butler that has a limp. Mm-hmm. And they want to know why they got the limp, why he yeah. got the limp. And is that part of the story? Because I mean, I just, you know, gave the butler a limp because I thought it was an interesting character quirk. But no, it's that butler just got, you know, into a fight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was part well, of the story. That butler got stabbed once. He's the uh, butler from Archer. Yeah. <laughs> Woodhouse. Not Woodhouse. Woodhouse. Poor Woodhouse. Yeah, no, if you give me an old lady that's walking with a cane, I'm like, what's up with her? Like, I'm going to think that she is the criminal. She's got to be hiding something. It's hiding in your cane. It's Yeah, Willy Wonka really just, like, screwed with our perception, too. <laughs> the, se- the second, like, the cane just goes away and he does a rollover and just, like, hops back on his feet. I don't know what to believe now. No, actually, Gene Wilder had said that the reason why he wanted to do that at the very beginning was so that you did not trust anything that he said from that point forward. Yep. He might even look like Johnny Depp the next time you see him. Wah, so, wah. well, yeah, being able to introduce even noir stuff into a setting that's not even necessarily noir. Like, I think that it's uh, the kind of storytelling and the kind of setting that you could put into almost anything if it's, you know, futuristic or if it's like a fantasy setting. If I were going to do that, the basic rules that I have to think about when I'm setting that up. Well, I'd say, you know, if... If, if you're sticking with kind of the classic stuff, it's like you're probably talking about a mystery. Yeah. I mean, you can have a mystery in any genre. And there should be twists and turns of some sort. You know, they're like the, the, the first person you suspect should I- ideally probably never be the person who's actually behind it. Unless you have the first person be the suspect and then they hit on two or three more and then they come back to the first person. Oh, I like um, that. Yeah. And they, and they, you know, they ultimately prove it in the end. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, there's there's a good chance that things will spiral out of control. There's certainly the nighttime side of it, night nighttime rain, smoke and shadows, and you can get stylistic with it and talk like I was talking about earlier about, you know, describing um, the smells and the sounds um, and, you know, having things be you can you can kind of go from two extremes like noir stories can often be in seedy locations and they can also be often in these really opulent locations. Right. Um, so it's uh, and there's usually a fair amount of cynicism um, and, and you've got protagonists that have shades of gray. I think that right. uh, there's there's the, the traditional paladin kind of yeah. sticks out like a sore thumb in a noir story. But if you've got a paladin that's kind of got like a pal- a paladin, for example, that's struggling with their faith, that's a different story. And hey. Fun thing, if you're out there thinking, I don't know where I can find a noir setting, there's this game I've heard about called Capers Noir, and it could be yours very soon. I think we've covered noir as a setting fairly in depth at this point. But you know what is uh, important to note is that you were the killer the whole time. I oh, was, no. and I am. I, oh, I thought you were, but then everything you did led me to believe otherwise. 
I am deceptive, and I wanted you to think it was uh, Edward Scissorhands. We really should have noticed the limp. It's why I use scissors for all my murders. <laughs> and you suck <laughs> yourself with the scissors, and that's why you have a limp? Yeah. You take out the limp because you accidentally missed one time, and you hit yourself in the leg, and now you limp. Yep. Man. This is, Legit. Yeah, you have a really good character backstory. I want to know more about you. <laughs> Unfortunately, I died. But you okay. He rose back up as a ghost, so you can still question him. Oh, I can still question oh, you. Yeah, sorry. No, my afterlife. <laughs> Why am I in the afterlife if I have to spend my entire day getting questioned by randos? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think I'd want the afterlife if that, if that were the case. That's the thing. I, I, th- that is the real reason I don't want my character to die now, because I know that all that's going to happen is I'm going to come back as a ghost. And I'm going to have to be constantly questioned by random people who want to know information from me, like I'm the Oracle of Delphi or some shit. <laughs> I don't, I don't want nice that. fall, Oracle of Delphi. Well Thank done. you. I've been playing AC Odyssey. That's, that's a noir. You're always wondering who did it. The Persians. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that hard. They couldn't have done it, Nathan. They're immortal. Uh, that's true. We're done now. Yeah. <laughs> These puns are getting out of hand. Craig, uh, can you tell us when Capers Noir uh, comes on to Kickstarter and just a little bit of information about it? Uh, yeah, it runs uh, on Kickstarter. It'll start on March March 12th. I'm not sure when this episode is coming up, so it might be already going or it might be coming soon. March yeah. 12th, um, that's a Tuesday, mm-hmm. and it'll run for about a month. Uh, there'll be a $10 tier. That's the, the base tier that gets you Capers Noir. Um, as a PDF, and then you'll get the uh, discount link to buy a soft cover at cost, which only costs like three or four bucks. Um, so super cheap. Um, and then there will be um, a, a few tiers that'll get you caught up if you missed out on capers. So you can you'll be able to get capers by itself or capers plus capers noir together. Mm-hmm. And then there's also some higher level tiers that uh, will allow you to get to uh, help uh, create an NPC to put into the sto- uh, into the into the book. Um, there's one tier that's going to be for NPCs, just kind of straight up. Like I did this with Capers too. I called the backer level Joes and Jane. So you you make a like a regular Joe or Jane. Like here's a, a regular character who's not a criminal or a cop, but they have powers. Mm-hmm. So you can populate your world with regular people oh. um, as well who have some oh, abilities. Sure. And then so there'll be a tier for that. And there's going to be another tier that's higher up that'll be for um, you'll help me. You'll help to pick some things, and I'll step and I'll, I'll I'll make sure that the stats work. But you'll be basically creating a monster character. So, um, like if you create a ghost, you're going to tell me who that person was, how they died, you know, what trouble their ghost has gotten into, and what they're involved in. And then we'll uh, we'll pick a few powers, and you know, I'll help you. I'll ask a few questions basically to kind of work out the stats, and then I'll write that up properly. All right. Uh, could I make creature from the Black Lagoon? <laughs> No. That's not really uh, Capers Noir, not, not really a noir monster. <laughs> it, it has a detective's hat on. <laughs> oh, well, well, yeah, now it's a PI, so yeah. I'm just going to tell people I have a really bad skin condition, and, yeah. and I have very oily skin. That's why it's moist all the time. Yeah, yeah. sure. That's right. Well, what, what's, your, what's your problem with that? Okay, fine. I won't do a creature from the Black Lagoon. Swamp thing. Glad we covered that. Okay. Just use Dick Grayson and call it good. Why would I want to be Nightwing? He's a detective. Why not? Yeah, but if you're going to do a detective in the Batman universe, you might as well just use Bruce Wayne. Or or no. Ed, or Edward Nigma. Can I make Batman as my NPC? <laughs> uh, you can make a Batman character for your home game just fine. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> but a rich philanthropist type character that has died. That's an interesting ghost. Oh. There we go. Good. Okay, so March twelfth, it, it comes out, and that runs for uh, is is that running for three weeks, four weeks? About about a month, yeah, till April eleventh. So the PDF should be available pretty quickly. Everything will kind of get f- fulfilled together as far as noir goes. Like when the PDF's ready, that means the book's ready too. Okay. Um, but I'm way ahead of the game on this. I've got artwork and layout and stuff, and you know that are artwork and, and graphic design are underway. Layout will be underway by the time the Kickstarter goes. So this this should be a pretty quick turnaround. Since it's such a small project, I wanted to make sure I got right out in front of it so that we're not sitting on like a six month turnaround. It, we should we should be able to fulfill, fulfill pretty quickly. Right, right, right. Like, like the only real big thing that you don't know yet is uh, what those custom NPCs would be. Yeah, there'll be a little bit of of, of time that's needed to put that stuff together, but that's only gonna be a matter right. of weeks. I'm gonna make a matter of weeks. I'm gonna make it very clear on the on the page that 
You sure. Know, you can't you can't spend three months dodging me. You got to be ready. You know, you want this. You got to be ready to generate that character with me quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's there's a time frame. Well, I mean, they, I feel like that's only fair. You yeah. know, yeah, you you do want an NPC, but at the same time, we need it in order to make the book. <laughs> so. Yeah, and waiting on waiting on one NPC delays the the entire book yeah. for everybody. And if just a quick note too, if uh, yes. if you want to see me explore other criminal and cop subgenres, because I have ideas for a couple of other things, then let's let's help make noir happen. Because I don't make the the second supplement unless the first supplement actually does okay. Uh, right. Because it's just it's a lot of time and effort that goes in, and if it just barely scrapes by, or I mean, if it fails, you know, it's dead. It just if it just scrapes by, then it's like, well, you know, do I spend the time on that and try to do another one, or do I just say, okay, I'm gonna right. roll on to a different game or do some freelancing or whatever? Are so. we gonna do Are we gonna do die chuckling instead, <laughs> <laughs> or murders and acquisitions to electric boogaloo? That's also a possibility. Sure. Um, why? <laughs> <laughs> If uh, anyone out there was interested in getting more information about you or Nerd Burger Games, or uh, if they were looking for more information about Noir, uh, where could they go? Um, you can find um, all sorts of stuff about my games at nerdburgergames.com. You can go to drivethroughrpg.com uh, to buy all the games except Noir. Um, but if you want to buy capers, by the way, if you want to buy the award-winning capers, Ooh. Um, Ooh. I want a Bamsey. It's a, oh wow! That's an award for uh, for supers games. Nice. If you want to, if you want to buy capers, take a look at the Kickstarter because you're going to get a better deal there than you will at drive through. Excellent. Um, and I'm at Nerdburger Craig on the Twitters. Excellent, great. And uh, of course, Alex, if they wanted to find more information about Delve, where could they go? You can go to delvecast.com. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, over at delvecast.com, you can find out who did it. Uh, we did. We did lots of things, and you can see them all there. It's not really a very good murder mystery, because <laughs> no one got murdered, and the mystery is basically, yeah, it's all there. The information is right there. We're not good at noir. You could also find us on every podcast app. Again, not a very good mystery. You just look us up. It's on iTunes and on Spotify and on and Google Play, everywhere, really. Uh, they found us very quickly. We were the murderer the entire time. You can also find us on Twitter. And this is going to be shocking to a lot of people. But I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited. And the show is at Delve Podcast. So congratulations. You just solved a mystery you didn't even know you were investigating, folks. <laughs> you <laughs> enjoy. Anywho, I'd like to thank Craig Campbell for coming back on the show. <laughs> you're welcome thank you uh i had a good time as always yeah yeah it's always uh, good to catch up with you and uh here's looking forward to to seeing noir uh take off uh on on the kickstarters uh good luck to you sir thank you very much and uh to everyone out there thank you for joining us and uh this is case closed goodbye everybody bye Yes. Do you have, like, police outside your door right now? It sounds like... Nope. That's Craig. That's me. Oh, you have police outside your door right now. Oh, no. I live on a main street, so there's going to be a noise every so often, and we can go ahead and make fun of it. I mean, if like, if you're in the middle yeah, of a long care. talk and I hear something coming, I can mute myself. Okay. Um, okay. But if I'm right in the it, middle of something, you know, how do you want to handle it? Do I... It, I don't think... it's. It'll add flavor it to adds, the episode. It adds flavor. It's okay. We'll just say that you're living in the noir. The cops are coming, see? The cops are coming, see? Man, see? Yeah, see? You're on to me. <laughs> you're, 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 what you're doing is you're doing, like, active research on how prohibition works. And so you told the <laughs> cops, come around once in a while and reprimand me. Bust up the joint. <laughs> Bust up the joint. It's all good.